When I first started off as a comedian, I really had no concept of what it was like in the behind the scenes, day to day lives of comedians. I had no idea what it was like to grind away and to work at it. I had never seen anyone showing that part of their journey before. All you see are the sort of comedians who have their comedy specials on Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever. You see them performing at the top clubs or all these massive stadiums, but you don't really get to see how they got there. Sometimes you might hear them talk about how they got there on a talk show, but that's always retrospectively after the fact. I thought to myself, what would it be like to show people really my comedy journey or my journey as an actor, because I do both comedy and acting, just to show people the reality of what it's actually like being a comedian. It's not the kind of five, 10, 15, 20 minutes you see on stage. It's a lot of other stuff in the background. This is episode one of The Grind, and I'm your host, Tyson Bradley. On my YouTube channel, you'll see videos of stand-up comedy, sketch comedy, maybe even a bit of improv comedy. I wanted to show the kind of other side of what goes on behind the scenes of someone who's working in the arts. Admittedly, I'm starting these videos a little bit late because it's now 2024 and I've been grinding for the past few years in some form or another. So I started performing, entertaining, acting ever since I was a kid. I think my parents knew from a very young age that this kid was going to be a performer. I did theater, I did classes, I did acting classes, I did improv groups. I was always doing that sort of thing, even just from a very young age. I would say once I graduated from secondary school, I basically kind of went down a different path. I took a more academic route and decided to go to Bible college to study to become a pastor. So that's what I thought I was going to do with my life, and that was what I trained for and, and aspired to. I felt like I was denying part of me for a long time, this sort of performance, entertainer, actor, creative side of me that I just sort of pushed to the back. Maybe you know what that's like. You wanted to work in the arts, and Somewhere along the way, you decided that you had to get a real job, as if working in the arts isn't a real job. I gave up on my dreams. At that time, I was also in a relationship where I felt like I had to get a stable job and, and work hard to provide for us. Really working in the arts, doing anything creative, just felt like it was off the cards, off the table. So I don't know if you remember, in 2020, we had this little thing called COVID and it basically meant that people weren't allowed to leave their houses for long periods of time. Do you remember that? Yeah. I started seeing all these adverts for Masterclass with Steve Martin teaching comedy. And uh, so I decided to get a subscription and uh, was spending a lot of time at home and decided to get the Masterclass subscription and started watching videos, not just comedy, but acting, singing, all that kind of stuff. And it, sort of reignited something in me. And then a little while later, I had a friend visiting from Canada and we decided to go to a comedy club. And I remember sitting there in the audience thinking, I feel like I could do that. Not in like a super cocky, arrogant way, but because I knew that I'd been acting as a kid and I'd done improv. So the only thing I hadn't tried was stand up, and I was used to being on stage. So that wasn't an issue. So I decided to give it a go and I, signed up for open mics, which I found through Facebook, uh, funny enough. I think I was just Googling where to find places to do stand-up comedy in London. So I sat down to write my first comedy set, my first five minutes, uh, word for word, planned out all my jokes, and it didn't go horribly, but it also didn't go great. I had no idea what I was doing. Now the problem with comedy is that you kind of have to learn it by doing it in front of an audience. You don't really get to just sit there in your bedroom and practice in front of a mirror because it's never going to be the same. With acting, you can practice your lines, you can read a script, you can memorize, you can do all that by yourself. With learning an instrument, you can sit at home and play the notes on a guitar and you can kind of know whether you're good or not. But with comedy, you don't know whether you're good or not until you do it in front of others. And the only way to get better is to keep doing it in front of others. So that's what I did. I made it my goal to do as many 
shows as possible. I ran into a famous comedian in a pub who told me that that's what I should do, was just do as many shows as possible. So that's what I did and have been doing ever since. So with my comedy journey, I began to not just watch the comedians who I liked, but analyze their style and how they did what they did in their craft. I looked at guys like Andy Kaufman, Jim Carrey, Robin Williams, and really started to kind of analyze what was it that I found funny about their acts. And I began to take the lessons that I learned from Steve Martin's masterclass on comedy, which was also very helpful, really life transforming for that kind of starting off period. Hey, welcome to Steve Martin's masterclass. I wrote out word for word my first five minutes and began just doing that same routine over and over and over. And eventually I got to the point that I was getting tired of my own punchlines. And so I decided to take the influence of people like Robin Williams, Jim Carrey, Andy Kaufman, and start doing characters. And so I came up with these, these characters that had their own routines, that they had their own five minute sets that they were doing. And that kind of sparked new life into my comedy. And I really enjoyed doing these kind of characters that I'd created because it was a bit of acting, but it was also a bit of stand-up. As a comedian, no matter how long I've been going, I'm still looking to try and learn from comedians who have gone before me, who have done far more gigs, done far better gigs, done the things that I want to do and gotten to the places that I want to go. And I try to ask them questions and just learn from them. And I remember speaking to one comedian who told me, you know, characters can be funny, but it's really hard to get booked at the bigger clubs if you are a character comedian. Unless you've got some sort of specific wild character that people know that's what they're getting. But if you do multiple characters like what I was doing, because I couldn't decide which one was my favorite, then a club books you and they don't know which comedian or which character they're getting that night. So I reverted back to just doing my normal written routines and, and wrote out and started kind of going back to doing normal stand-up, I guess, whatever normal stand-up is. And I remember coming off of a show once and speaking to a promoter who told me that, he said, you know, Tyson, your written jokes are great, but it's those moments that you started riffing and talking to the audience, that's when you came alive. And so I thought to myself, hmm, what would happen if I just did that? What would happen if I just got up there and just riffed and talked to the audience and improvised and thought of all these jokes like on the spot for, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. So that's kind of how I found my niche style of comedy. And I still get people tell me today that they don't like the fact that I do crowd work and they just want to see just do the written bits or whatever. and. Other people have said, well, you'll never be able to do a stadium or you'll never be able to do TV or any of this kind of stuff. So you're always going to have your critics and um, that's just the way it is. So hopefully that catches us up to speed of where I'm at in terms of comedy in January 2024. I'm not quite an amateur. It's not like I'm just starting off, but I'm also not... Um, headlining these massive stadium tours and doing Netflix specials and stuff like that. I'm kind of somewhere in this weird period in between and that's where I want to show you is that grind of me having moved on from the early days of doing those first five minute spots to now. I performed all around the UK where I started off doing comedy. I performed in Toronto, Vancouver and Los Angeles and Brussels. The point of these videos is to show you the grind. So. I'm not trying to embellish or pretend that I'm much further in my career than I am, but I also do recognize that I'm, I'm also not just starting off. So it's not just the beginning of the grind, we're kind of still grinding away. In terms of my acting career, as I said, I started doing theater and classes and improv groups and all of that kind of training that I did back in Canada from all throughout my childhood up until about the age of 18. Then I took that break got into comedy and even then still didn't really go back into pursuing acting right away because I was so focused on learning this new craft that I was trying to learn of 
namely how to be a stand-up comedian. So I'm doing about 10 to 15 shows a month, which makes it really hard to find the time to do a film shoot or to do acting or to do these various things when you're doing a lot of stand-up in your evenings. So it can be hard to manage both. But since getting back into doing more acting bits and stuff like that, I've done some background stuff. I had a lead role in a film that's coming out and just trying to still do a lot of networking, trying to grind away and network and get to know people and hopefully open up more opportunities. So stay tuned for more episodes on the grind and we'll see how we get on.